We're going to go straight to uh, Q&A. Uh, we've got about five, ten minutes left. I, I'm going to take three questions, um, and then um, uh, we'll do another batch of, of three. And there's lots of hands up, so I'm going to stand up here so I can see. Uh, uh, so first, uh, uh, the gentleman uh, over here. Yeah. And please say who you are. Hi, uh, Arun Sundarajan from New York University. Um, thanks for the... Uh, Thanks for the inputs. Um, I had a question, not to any one of you in particular, um, but uh, well, one of the things that I didn't see represented in um, you know, what you talked about was uh, one of the things that uh, technological progress has given us recently is um, a tremendous amount of micro data about interactions between people. Um, I've often seen um, sociologists, actually, well, you know, physicists and computer scientists masquerading as sociologists, um, uh, indicating that um, you know the analysis of these might be sort of a new a new day for social sciences, and you know, often um, it's uh, you know it's very impressive to me how they 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 seem to want to do this without the um, aid of really good models. And so in, in, in thinking about the availability of this kind of data, this kind of micro data for yep. interactions, I mean, like, you know, what kind of models do you think uh, we should be using because uh, we're able to collect this kind of data pretty easily these days? Great, thank you. So uh, how can we use micro data in models? Um, Lord Skidelsky. Yeah. seen by the panelists as, sorry, um, all, all um, com complexity economics seems to draw its inspiration from um, complex natural systems. Um, are hum human behavior systems seen by the panelists as analogous to a natural um, system or as part of the natural world and therefore subject to the same laws however um, complex those laws are, are, are seen to be. If so, I wonder what philosophers, ethicists, and those who have studied human behavior through the arts would think about complexity systems. Is the ultimate purpose of complexity systems to develop better systems of human engineering and control? Um, are complexity theorists alert to the oldest debate in human thought between free will and determinism, and on what side of this debate do they come? Uh, uh, as expected, a superb question, which we could spend a whole hour on, I'm sure. Um, uh, let me go to uh, Simon's attic, and then we'll take these three, and then we'll do another round. Yeah, I have uh, Simon's attic. I have somewhat of a plumbing question, I suspect. Uh, which is, it's always struck me in looking at the work in this field that it's, it's an incredibly data-hungry area. Um, and yet the actual problems that we try and solve often, and there are some notable exceptions, are almost entirely devoid of large sta stable data sets. Um, and, and so I think the question is, and Ian, I'm sort of reflecting a little bit on the discussion we had yesterday uh, over dinner, uh, you, know, you know, how can not just the conceptual thinking, but the methodological modeling and predictive capabilities be most effectively used from this paradigm in situations where data is scarce and relatively unstable. Right, thanks. Um, I, I'm actually, I'm gonna start with uh, Lord Skidelsky's question. Who, who wants to volunteer for that one? <laughs> Ian, you're very brave. Um, what can we learn from nature? I think the sorts of work that Andy Haldane and Bob May have, for example, done, and in the most recent issue of Nature, there's, there's a good example of that, uh, is really instructive. So there's a lot one can understand from natural systems, the way they build resilience, uh, and the way that evolutionary processes have enforced uh, resilience across natural systems. There's one critical difference, of course, is that those systems are evolutionary over periods of millions of years. And we're in a, in a process here where we're trying to prevent crises uh, within weeks or decades. So um, that's, that's a critical difference. But I think there's a huge amount to be learned. And one of the things we really do need to do is learn 
not only from natural systems, but some man-made or man-spread things. Pandemic, for example. How do you manage the spread of pandemics? What's the sort of interventions? How do you get early warning signals, et cetera? So there's an important thing around that. If I may just quickly also address, I'm not going to answer your question on free will, will versus determinism, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. We need a philosophical conversation. On the, on the microdata and data deluge um, question, the, this paradox, there's a data deluge and there'll be more and more of a data deluge. And one of the things we're trying to understand is how do we learn from other systems that also have data deluge. That's why we, for example, have cosmologists. So they are looking at extremely large data sets, billions and billions of, of points with a lot of noise, and they're using crowdsourcing, like Galaxy Zoo Project, for example. It's a fascinating example where you get 100,000 volunteers to help you sort the data, uh, and then you obviously need your conceptual models. And there's no substitute. Data is obviously garbage in, garbage out, unless you have a conceptual model uh, behind it. And that's why what we're doing here at this weekend, I think, is very, very significant. Where you don't have data, you really have to have an intuitive understanding. The fact there was no data is absolutely no excuse. There was tons of data for the financial crisis. We were just looking at it in the wrong way. We weren't aggregating uh, at the global level, even the national level, data that was being aggregated uh, in, for other purposes. So it's, I think there is data. We just don't know how to use it. Right, now uh, we're, we're getting the time up assigned, but because I know everyone's going to be so efficient because there's so many economists in the room and getting to the next session, I'm just going to let us overrun for a few minutes. I'm going to let uh, have Brian come in. We'll take one or two more questions and then we'll, uh, then we'll break. A uh, quick comment on data, and that is um, two questions were asked. And I think data are very, very important. Uh, this uh, area of complexity right across the social sciences and into engineering and so on, is very heavily driven by looking at data. We have Don Farmer here in the room and uh, a great deal of Don's research and many, many other people's research is taking large data sets and seeing uh, how we can understand the behavior that gives rise to such data. Uh, so I think this area is very much data-driven or empirically driven, and I think that's a very good thing. I just loved the question that Robert Sadelsky asked. Uh, fabulous. Uh, it's one of these things where I'll get an answer to it maybe in 10 years' time or something like that. But very quick comment on that. Uh, all the sciences, I think, are changing from uh, viewing physics as their primary inspiration to viewing biology uh, as their primary uh, set of inspirations. I, I won't go into uh, what I mean by that, but suffice it to say that complexity is, base complexity is basically viewing the economy or whatever blank you want to fill in in a biological way. As to the free will, uh, I would point out that neoclassical economics, with its machine-like, uh, super-rational, super-deterministic agents, doesn't have much room for free will. But if you're modeling agents in complex systems, you can allow them to have imagination, you can allow them to have moral dilemmas, and you can allow them to be human beings. I think the, a really good answer would be a lot deeper than that, but that's the first reaction. Since I'm getting, I'm getting this sign uh, from, uh, from the organization, I'm going to give Tad actually just the last word, and then unfortunately we're going to have to, have to break. Well, <clears throat> I, I think Lord Skidelsky's question uh, is enormously important, and very quickly, because we are out of time. Uh, the, in answer to the first part of your question, uh, definitively yes. Uh, complexity theorists see the hum human society and the human economy as embedded within larger natural systems. Uh, biological, ecological, physical systems. And the principles that govern those systems, the scientific laws, such as the laws of thermodynamics, have to apply within the social and economic systems that are subparts of those larger systems. Uh, but I don't, I'm not scared by this, and I don't think it has uh, dire implications for our conception of ourselves. I think, though, that we have to understand that what it requires, as the other speakers have indicated, is a pretty, pretty fundamental conversation about what it is to be human and who we are. And we are going to probably revise our conception of agency 
in some pretty fundamental ways. And perhaps this, this debate, this ancient debate between free will and determinism in the context of complexity theory will just disappear, which I think would probably be a good thing. And I agree with Brian that, that what I see in complexity theory is a flourishing of possibility, of latitude for behavior rather than constraint. And I, all I see, I'm afraid, in neoclassical economics in many cases is constraint. Uh, that's an uh, excellent note to end on. I, I want to thank our uh, I want to thank our panelists.